All right, well, we're, <coughs> we're so excited. Um, uh, something that we decided to uh, start this year, last year we went to a parent, we, we went to, uh, we hosted a parenting conference with about three or four other churches. And for the first time, I learned about um, this, uh, this book called Raising Modern Day Knights. And they talked about how in the Jewish culture, we have these, um, you know, these almost like graduation moments in a, in a child's life that help them kind of know that they're taking the next step in life, you know. For instance, when, you're, when you become 13, in a Jewish home, you, you're, if you're a guy, you go through a bar mitzvah. If you're a girl, you go through a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. And what that means is, you know, after that, you're now an adult. You're a man, you know. And so you make big boy decisions, and, and they start, you know, grooming you as a man. So it's a very definite line. You know, before you were a child, now you're a man. And one of the things I recognize about our culture today is, we don't really have those kind of delineations. We used to. Um, we used to have those kinds of things in culture uh, where, you know, you would have, uh, when your daughter turned 16, you would give her a purity ring. or you would, There would be some kind of thing that would kind of help you differentiate you're going to the next step uh, in life. And so I, uh, this book, Raising Modern Day Nights, kind of challenged me that, you know, that's one thing we need to reintroduce into our culture. You know, because what I find is we have uh, men that are, young men that are 25, 26, 27, and they're still addicted to their Xbox. You know, they really haven't grown up. They haven't really been, you know, called out as a man. And, uh, and so we want to be able to have, uh, kind of build those things back into our culture. And I thought the church is a perfect way to do that. And so we have uh, set up some uh, graduation points, if you will, uh, one of those is when they go from uh, preschool and they go into their um, elementary school years. And then the others, when they go from elementary school into middle school, and then from middle school into high school, and then from high school into adulthood. And what we, how we communicate it to the students is, you know, when you go from preschool to uh, elementary school, now it's your time, it's your challenge to learn about God, and you're going to spend the next few years just discovering all these things about God, and they're so hungry to learn, and, and you can tell them things, and they believe you. It's amazing, you know. Uh, that's why Jesus says we have to become like little children, because God tells us things, and we don't believe Him. And He says, you need to go back a few years and become like, you know, when you used to, you know, believe the things I told you. You know, and so then they believe you. And then when they go from elementary school to junior high, now they're owning their faith. It's their faith. It's not their parents' faith. It's not their mom and dad's faith. It's their faith. More people come to Christ. I think it's something like 90% of all people that come to Christ come to Christ in, between the ages of 11, 12, 13 in that time. So if you've received Christ past 13, you're a miracle. You are a miracle right there, you know. Uh, I'm right in the middle, I re or right at the end, I received Christ when I was 13. So uh, most kids, most people receive Christ around 13. When you go from junior high to high school, now the challenge for you is learning how to live out your faith in front of your friends. Because isn't that the big challenge? You want to fit in, you want to be a part, but you got to learn what it means to be a believer and stand against the tide and stand against the world and, and develop a faith that works in everyday life. And then, of course, when you graduate from high school to, uh, you know, out of high school, you know, what I say now is you're not the future of the church, you are the church. You know, people used to say, well, the youth are the future of the church. No, they are the church. They are the leaders of the church. And so when you graduate from high school, you're now a leader in the church. And we look to you to, uh, for leadership. We look to you to serve. You're, it's time to get your big boy pants on and, you know, and, uh, and carry your weight in the body of Christ because you're fully responsible now. You know? And so the weight of discipleship is on your shoulders. The weight of leading people to Christ is on your shoulders. The weight of growing the church is, is on Jesus' shoulders. Uh, but you know, he uses you as uh, his representative to to do that. And so you kind of step up into the adult world and you join all of us here 
in the big congregation. That's why we don't have a high school ministry that meets during Sunday morning because I look to the high school students as you're part of the church now. And you need to serve and be involved in the church just like a regular, uh, uh, like a regular person. That sounded so <laughs> terrible, you know. But, you know, you're, you're, you are the church, and we, and we look to you to step into your role as leaders of the church. And so we want to take a moment and recognize uh, all those different grades. And so we're going to invite up now all of our, um, uh, our grade school kids, Madison, Scott, uh, Cindy, Valverde, Luke Kessler, uh, Holden Pasco, Jaden Johnson, and Ella Kittler. Ella's in uh, Europe right now, so I don't know who else here. And also Jacob Hansen. Technically, Jacob already moved out because he had it with the little kids. He wanted to be with the big kids. So he's already moved out. So we want to just take a moment and recognize these are our young kids that are growing up. And I'm going to invite their teachers to come up and pray over them as they kind of go to the next step. Where are the teachers? The teachers. Come on, Chris. The teachers. Here we go. Yeah, and we actually have some cool things. We have, uh, we have a little cupcake. And uh, for Jacob, going into junior high, we got you a nice Bible. And it's got your name on it. So now, this is your Bible. You own it. And you make sure you read it and mark all kinds of notes in it. Make it. You can do whatever you want to. That's your Bible, okay? So you don't have to, like, keep it nice like your mom wants you to keep it nice and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> you can just write all over. You can put notes in it. You can highlight it. You can just fill it up with God's stuff. because that's. So, and then I wrote you a special letter just for you. Okay, and it has a, a scripture and something that the Lord shared on my heart for you, okay? So you make sure you read that, all right? I'm Chris. <laughs> uh, if you'd all bow your heads, I'd like to say a prayer over these little guys. Dear God, thank you so much for um, all these amazing kids. Um, just getting to see them grow up and... Um, Getting to see you work in their lives is just such an amazing thing. I pray that um, you continue to keep them, you continue to move in their hearts through their lives and help them touch other, people's as they, uh, other people as they grow up, God. Um, just continue to inspire them and uh, give them just such a want, such a hunger to, to grow up and learn more about you, to be closer to you, God, and be yours. Um, we lift these kids up to you in your precious name, Father. Amen. All right. Now we're going to invite up. Uh, thank you, guys. Now go learn about God. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing we did is, is you'll notice there's letters in here. Um, they received two letters each. One le letter from the teacher that's sending them, to, that's kind of saying, this is what we see God doing in your life. And another letter from the teacher welcoming them you know, kind of welcoming them into their class. And so it's kind of a special thing. And you want to keep these letters and see if, if we were false prophets or not. Um, <laughs> next, I want to invite up Gabby Angler and Allison Hansen and Hannah Fuscher. <laughs> these are the tall crew the tall crew they're all taller than me <laughs> and then I also want to mention that um, uh, we had another graduate David uh, Stoner graduated from adult transition and so we want to give him a shout out <laughs> come on up we have something special for, that we're going to be giving to David this week so God bless you David you're going to come up Awesome. And let's invite up Pam and Guillermo and uh, uh, Jeff to pray over these. And um, for Gabby, we got her little devotional. So this is your own little devotional. And, and it's got your name on it, so you'll know it's yours. And that's my, actually, this is my favorite devotional. This was uh, um, written by uh, 
Ann Graham Lotz, so Billy Graham's daughter. And so it's, it's one of my favorite. And then we have here uh, a Bible for Hannah and a Bible for Allison. And those also, we're going to get your Bible too. And we got your, and your um, they have your name in it, and I have a letter in there for you guys both. And just, it's just a scripture from the Lord and uh, just a little short encouragement from the Lord. And, uh, and I want to say to you in particular, you're now the church. You're like, you're, you've grown up, you've graduated. You're like, you're, you're not little girls anymore. You're young women of God. And now we're looking to you to, to, be, to, to lead people to Jesus. We're looking to you to, to um, you know, disciple. We're looking to you to be the church to your generation. Because there's people you're going to reach that we can't reach. As much as I want to, I can't fit into skinny jeans. <laughs> and uh, you really don't want me to either. Uh, it's really embarrassing. But, uh, but you guys are, you know, God has placed you where you are. And he wants to use you mightily for his name. And he's going to use you. And Gabby, you're now stepping into that world where you're going to learn how to live out your faith in, in everyday life. You know, you, you kind of grew up in the Christian school, and now you're kind of moving into uh, the mainstream schools. And, and so you're going to face pressures you never faced before. And, you're going to, and Jesus is going to become real to you like he's never become before. It's going to be a whole new season for you. And, uh, and, here's, and I keep wanting to tell you this because it's in the verse I gave you. But days of rejoicing are coming for you. There's going to be days of, of joy and celebration coming into your life. And so hold on to that promise because that's a promise from the Lord. So I'm going to give it to first Pam and Guillermo and then to Jeff. It's been our pleasure to, to know Gabby for quite a while uh, when she was much shorter. Um, our daughter Elena and Gabby are, are really good friends, not best friends probably, but uh, so it's been, it's been really neat. And you know, Gabby, the, the verse that, that um, God gave me is, uh, comes from Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, and it says, it's just a little part of it, it says, in quietness and in confidence will be your strength. She's laughing. Um, <laughs> when Isaiah says this, he's, he's telling this to the, people, uh, to the people of Israel, and then he says, but you weren't, you don't do that. They, they're, they're trying to get help from, uh, from Egypt. But in, in, in Gabby's case, I really see that as, as, as a strength that you have. It's kind of funny because if you know her, she's not quiet. Um, but, but what God was telling me is that you have like a, this quiet confidence about you. Uh, and we've, it's been really neat for us to see that the spirit of service that you have, whether you help with the, with the little kids, and you're just a, a, a good example. So enough talking. Let's just pray for you. Father, we want to lift up Gabby to you right now, Lord. We thank you for her, Lord. We thank you for her heart for you. And we pray, Lord, that you would go before her. And Lord, that in the quietness and in confidence in you will be her strength. Father, we uh, just ask that you would continue to bless her, draw her closer to you every day, Lord, and help her to be the example that you want her to be, Lord, that she would bring glory to your name as she serves you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, we have uh, Hannah, Allie, and David here, and uh, I just want to, I'm not a talker like Guillermo. I put it in a letter, and you guys can read it, <laughs> and it'll be a blessing to you, but uh, I want to pray a blessing over you guys. Um, Father, uh, we come before you, Lord God, and we just give thanks to uh, the godly parents that these young men and women have been given, Lord God, that they saw fit to bring, bring them to church, to bring their children to church, and to raise them in the ways of the Lord. And we thank you for that, and, and ask a blessing upon the parents for doing that, Lord God. And we thank you for the work that we've seen, Lord God, as the parents have stepped forward, and uh, you have begun your work, Lord God. And we just ask now that you would carry on that work, Lord God, and that you would uh, bring it to completion, Lord God, that you would go before them, Lord, that you would uh, make their way straight, Father that you would reveal to them the plan you have for their lives that they step out into adulthood, Father. We thank you for the work that you're doing, Lord God, and that you will continue to do, Lord God. I pray a blessing upon each and every one of them here, Lord God, as, you, as we send them out and you, you go with them, Father, in your precious name. Amen. 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 All right, let's give them a hand.
I love that. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the Lord is going to do through these young men and women as they grow up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Well, we're going to continue our series in the book of Proverbs uh, called Wisdom Calls Aloud. And uh, we've been studying uh, Proverbs on Thursday nights. We're through, I think, Proverbs 26, and we're going to be finishing uh, this week. But today I wanted to talk about wisdom in communication. Wisdom in communication. And uh, I was thinking about this. You know, how many words do you speak in a day? Have you ever thought about that? How many words do you actually speak in a day? In fact, uh, you know, you've also heard that, that kind of that thing that women speak more words than men. Have you heard that? You know, is that, is that something that's true? Well, what's interesting is, is, is uh, there's an old study that said that, that women speak something like 20,000 words a day and men speak 7,000 words a day. And so that women actually speak three times as many words. And I, I was thinking about that, and I thought, at first I thought that made sense because, you know, all they taught me in man school was uh, whenever your wife something, says something, you say, yes, dear. And, uh, or you say, you know, okay, dear, whatever you say, dear, or that looks great on you, dear. Um, so there's, you don't really learn a, a whole lot of uh, conversation. Um, but there's a recent study that was put together by the University of Arizona, and it reports that men talk just as much as women. And they say that men speak about 16,000 words a day, average of 16,000 words, both men and women. Uh, this article goes on to say that they actually took and they, they had these digital voice recorders, and they recorded people over an eight-year period. And the researchers discovered that women spoke around 16,215 words a day, while men spoke 15,669 words a day. That was the average. And I thought that was in interesting. So men and women use the same number of words uh, every day. But what is different is what they use their words for. You know, men use their words to primarily order food and Women, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, for instance, women tend to talk about relationships. So they spend a lot of their time talking about relationships, whereas men tend to talk about technology and sports. You know, they tend to talk about things that are, that are going on. Um, another difference is women tend to be more consistent. You know, it's their, women were more consistently speaking 16,000 words a day, whereas you know, the, the, the two extremes, the, the person that spoke the least per day was 700 words, and the person that spoke the most per day were 47,000 words, and uh, both of them were men. So men tend to be more extreme. Either you get Chatty Charlie or you get Silent Sam, you know, you know and, and, but there's, there's kind of nothing in between there. Uh, but with all these words going on, one thing is for certain. You know, Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. In other words, the more we talk, the more opportunities we have to say something that we will regret, <laughs> you know, that will offend someone, that will hurt someone, that will get us into trouble. And Proverbs has a lot to say about wisdom and how we talk to one another. And so we're going to look at wisdom in communication, how to use our words wisely, and what happens when we don't. Now, let's turn, first of all, to Proverbs chapter 15 in your Bibles. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Uh, but Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. And we're going to look at verse 4. It says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. And then turn over one chapter to 16, verse 24. It says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. You know, the Bible is clear that there is a connection between our heart and our mouth. There's a connection between our heart and our mouth. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. So there's a connection between what's in our heart and what comes out of our mouth. And words are the conduit 
from one heart to another. It's how we communicate our hearts to each other. So when you communicate, you have a choice. Uh, are my words going to be a tree of life? Or am I going to use my words to break the Spirit? You know, am I going to be a tree of life or am I going to break someone's spirit? You know, in Proverbs 15, 4, it speaks of wholesome words being a tree of life. In, that, in the Hebrew, that word wholesome is actually the word marpe, marpe. And it's uh, translated healing or health. Healing or health. And so it's the same word that Isaiah uses when he speaks of God healing the nations. And so what he suggests is that your words have the power to bring health and healing into the hearts of people. You know, when you speak healing words to people, you know, it becomes a tree of life to them. Solomon says that pleasant words bring sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. You know, um, I lived in the South for a little bit and, and uh, kind of grew up there. My dad was stationed at Paris Island in South Carolina. And, and you've heard me talk about how we grew up in a trailer. So I'm Southern white trailer trash um, and all that sort of stuff. But the thing is, is that, uh, you know, in the South, they're very polite. It's a very polite place to be from. And, and you can say anything you want to as long as you say, bless your heart afterwards. You know, like that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen, bless your heart. You know, you can see just about anything. And they do. You know, oh, that Jean, she is just a troublemaker. Bless her heart. You know? And, and, there's, and there's this kind of this thing. It's, they can say anything, and it feels like, oh, that was such a great compliment. Thank you very much. You know, but our words, you know, pleasant words bring sweetness to the soul. It brings health to the bones. It's an incredible thing to think that my words carry such authority and power. But they do. There was a study done, uh, and it's called the 30 million word gap. And what they discovered was 86 to 98 percent of the words used by children by the age of three were derived from their parents. And uh, so the words, the exact words are all derived from their parents. Not only the words that they use, but how long they have conversations, the length of their conversations, how they communicate, the, the forcefulness of their communication, all of these things were learned, imitated from their parents. What they found out also is that if you came from a lower income family, you endured two discouraging comments for every one encouraging comment in your life. Whereas the, as, as people became... Uh, higher up in their income level, they found that people in higher income brackets, by the time an age, a kid was the age of three, they would have heard uh, 560,000 more words of encouragement than a, a child that grew up in a low income family. And so that low income family child, by the time they're three, they've mastered the language of discouragement. And that language of discouragement is what sets the course of their life. You know, interesting to think. The power of words and how your words it, speaking into the life of your children can either uh, release blessing and life into them or can actually discourage them before they can even talk just by listening to the words that we speak as parents. And how important it is to pay attention to how we communicate and what we communicate. And um, this is not meant to say, oh man, I've been so bad at that. I feel terrible right now. No, that's not the, that's not the goal. The goal is this, that we recognize it. And we say, okay, I've, maybe I've been that way, but today is a new day. And God can turn things around. And we can begin today speaking blessing into our children's lives and God can begin to turn around their minds and, and begin to fill them with different uh, words and choices. We have the power to give life or to crush the human spirit with our words. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat 
its fruit. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We want to impart grace. And, you know, there are some of us today that you're carrying still to this day the effects of words that have been spoken into your life. You know, that you've carried, you know, beliefs and things that you've come to believe because of things that were said. And the Lord has good news for you. You can be free from those words. You can be set free from the effects of those words in your life. It says in Proverbs 4.4, 4, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands, and live. He says, listen to my word. That, that word retain means to grasp hold of, to cling to it, to hold on to it. And so in order to reverse these words in our lives, what do we do? We cling to God's word. We cling to what he says about it. We hold on to his truth, how he defines us, what he says about us. And we, you know, we grab a hold of it as if it's our very life. And it says, you will live. This will, this will turn back the, the course of things in your life and you will live. That's why it's so important for us to speak blessing over one another and to be encouraging to each other. You know, I want to be known for what I'm for, not what I'm against. And, you know, there's so many people in the church today, you know what they're against, you know, but you don't know what they're for. Oh, I don't like those people over there. They believe this. I don't like that people over there. They're not biblical. I don't like those people over there. And they'll tell you all the reasons why they don't like someone, but they won't tell you anything that is good and what's right and proper. The Bible says, whatsoever things are good, you know, think on those things. Whatsoever things are praiseworthy, worthy of praise, think on those things. Second thing, Solomon mentions those who lie. In Proverbs 26, 28, he talks about a lying tongue. He says, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. And here's the truth. Lying is a cover-up for hatred. That's what lying is. Lying is a cover-up for hatred. Solomon says, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. In Proverbs 26, 24, it says, He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. And if you're struggling with lying, it's because there's hatred in your heart. That's what you're dealing with. And I find those that struggle with lying are, are some of the most resentful people that I know. You know, that by being deceitful, it becomes the way that they keep from dealing with the intense emotions that are in their heart. You know, and, and really, when you look at that, what causes that hatred, what causes that anger that's in there, it usually comes because you've been offended. Something has happened in your life that has really hurt you or offended you. Something that was inequitable, unjust. And you look at it and you say, that's not fair. And we have all these reasons why we let anger come up in our hearts. And you need to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with that hatred. You need to let the Holy Spirit deal with that ha hatred. It's the same for those that use flattery. They flatter to cover up their hatred. And Solomon says, don't listen to it. Uh, in Proverbs 26, 26, he says, Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. You know, at some point in time, that hatred in their heart will come out publicly. And so when I hear someone that has a problem with lying, I don't brand them and say, oh, you're a terrible liar. You know, I can't trust you. I think there's a person that has been so hurt in life. They're so filled with so much hatred over what's happened that they use deceit to keep from dealing with the real emotions that are there. You see, they, they, they don't even aware, they're not even aware of how intense it is and how much they're trying to run away from it. And the same thing with people that flatter me. You know, usually the ones that flatter you want your job. Um, so you just kind of, uh, you kind of don't listen to it. Third, Solomon mentions a backbiting tongue. You know, those that are backbiting. It says in verse 25, verse, or chapter 25, Proverbs 25, 
verses 22 and 23. The north brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. Now, most of us really don't know what that's talking about, right? When you say the north brings the rain, does that bother anybody? Does anybody sit there and go, oh, wow, what a bummer? No, because we don't live in Israel. We don't live in Palestine. But if you lived in Palestine, this is what you would know. The west, bring, the west wind brings the rain, not the north. The rain doesn't come from the north. It comes from the west. So if rain comes from the north, then it would take you by surprise, wouldn't it? You'd be shocked. You'd be like, what is going on here? This world is falling apart. You know, the rain's coming from the north. It should be coming from the west. What's going on? That's what it's like when you encounter a backbiting tongue. That word backbiting means hidden. It's in hiding. You don't know about it. Why? Because it's behind your back. You know, you don't know what's behind your back. Unless you're a mother-in-law, you have eyes in the back of your head, and you can see everything that's happening in the back. You know, but the thing is, is like, you know, but that backbiting is, it's in the back. You don't know what's going on. And so when it, when it hits you, what does it do? Wait, what's going on here? Why are you saying this? How can that be? You know, that kind of takes you by surprise, isn't it? You're shocked by it. And your natural reaction is anger. You get an angry countenance. You know, you're angry. Now, it's not a sin to get angry. Some people think it's a sin to be angry. It's not a sin to be angry. But it's what you do with your anger that can lead to sin. It's how you handle your anger. Because anger basically tells you what is really important to you. It reveals what's really important. So if somebody, you know, if you have a, like the, I have this cupcake here. This is, uh, I wouldn't die for this cupcake uh, unless it was homemade or it was from that cupcake place in Newport Beach that makes massive cupcakes. Um, then I might die for it. Uh, but if you were to come up and, you know, if this is one of those cupcakes and you came and you stepped on this cupcake, I would be mer very angry at you. Um, I might even be bitter for a long time. <laughs> now, why would that be? Because I value... Good, good cupcakes. Now, if this was a dozen cookies, I would hate you for life because I like cookies even more. Um, but the thing is that whatever is important to you, if something does something to that, what are you going to do? You're going to get you're going to get angry, right? Because it's it's valuable to you. It's important to you. And so, so often we go through life and things that are important to us get violated, and then we think, oh, I can't be angry because I'm a Christian. You know, so I'm going to. You know, I, I have to be a nice person, you know. No, what happens over time is you become a bitter person because you begin to ignore what's important to you and over time what is important to you gets kind of snuffed out and you, and you get walked all over. That's not what God has for us. You know, so what we do is we pay attention to those things. Okay, this was really important to me. What do we do? We talk about it. We do Matthew 18. We, talk, we confront them and say, you know, when you did this, it really hurt me because this is important to me. I value this. Maybe you didn't know that, but I thought I would share it with you. You know, I, I really, it really, it, you know, to see you throw away all the Krispy Kreme donuts to keep them from me really offends me, you know. I know you're trying to help me, but it's not helping me right now. What would help me is for you to give me those Krispy Kreme donuts. Um, you know, but that's kind of what it is. You know, we're sharing what is important to us, what's valuable to us. You know, that's why Jesus says, be angry, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with it that day. You know, don't let it, heart, you know, fester in your heart, but take care of it. What you do with your anger can lead to sin if you're not careful. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. You see, you and I, we are called to inherit 
a blessing from God. That's, that's what we're called to do. And so we don't need to say things about each other behind our backs. We don't need to treat each other that way. And we don't need to worry about it when somebody says something behind our back. Because God desires to bless us. And God's desire to bless us is greater than what anybody can say against us. You see, if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, I have, uh, there's a friend of mine, Victor uh, Mamboso. He's about a 400-pound South African. And um, he was in a band called Friends First. And he would say, if God be before me, no one can be before me. You know, because God is so big, you know, God fills up the span, expanse so nobody can be where God is because he takes up all the room, you know. And, uh, and it's that same way. If God is for us, there's no one that can be against us. No word, nothing said against you can prosper. No weapon, nothing done uh, can harm you because God's intent is to bless you. The fourth thing uh, that Solomon mentions is those who are contentious. In Proverbs 18, 6 through 7, it says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for bl blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. You know, those who are contentious like to find fault with others. That's what they do. Everything that comes out of their mouth is a criticism, a complaint, a verbal combat. You know, I like to call it tung, tung fu. You know, they, have, they practice the art of tongue fu, you know. And the thing is, is that contentious people are everywhere. You know, they're at your job, they're at school, you know, they're walking around town, you know, they, they even go to church, you know. They're contentious people everywhere. They can even be in your own home. In fact, five of the Proverbs are specifically about a contentious wives. And Solomon says, trying to restrain a contentious wife is like trying to restrain the wind. You know? But here's the thing. The root cause for a contentious person is pride. It's really pride. Proverbs 21, 24 says, a proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. You see, they're contentious because they think they've got one up on you. They can judge you. They use criticism as a way to dominate a situation. And so the only way that they can say something critical of you is that they believe they're better than you. And so they can say something against you. But here's the good thing that I love about Jesus. The Bible says, will not the judge of the earth do right? There's only one judge I have to be concerned about. And that's Jesus himself. All the other judges, all the other critics in my life, I don't have to worry about. Because at the end of my life, they're not going to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, they're probably going to look at me and say, how did you get in here? You know, but most of them, you know, but there's only one well done, good and faithful servant that I'm looking for. And that's that one that comes from my heavenly father. When he looks at me, that's the one I'm working for. And so I don't need to listen to uh, those that um, speak out uh, and criticize and try to dominate a situation through that criticism. Philippians 2.3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each esteem others better than himself. When I'm esteeming you as better than me, I'm not going to find fault with you. My goal, my vision, what I'm paying attention to is how I can bless you. How can I be a blessing in your life? How can I encourage you? How can I help you? How can I come alongside of you? Not to prove that I'm more right than you are. The fifth thing that Solomon mentions and, uh, is, the, is uh, gossip tail bearers. Proverbs eleven thirteen it says, a tail bearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Now, there's some confusion on what gossip is, because 
you know, we think someone that talks about people, that's a gossip, right? And, uh, and so a gossip is anyone that talks about people. So when people start talking about people, then they think, oh, we're gossiping right now. But that's not exactly what it means. You know, and so it's kind of funny because you'll see people's like, well, I'm not a gossip. And so, they'll, so when you walk up, they'll quit talking, right? But then when you walk away and they get with the two or three people that they really trust, then they gossip all day long. You know, it's kind of a funny thing. But, uh, but talking about people isn't what gossip is. The word used for talebearer can actually be translated slanderer or marketplace. Marketplace. And you think, wow, what, what does it mean by marketplace? Why would a talebearer be translated marketplace? Well, it's speaking of someone that uses information like currency to gain a greater position in the marketplace. No, they'll, they'll look for the inside information so they can use it to flip someone, you know? And how many people have encountered people like that where, you know, you're in a business situation and they're, you know, hey, what are you doing over there? You know, wow, wow, that's really cool. I really like that. Then they go over to their boss and say, you know what so-and-so is doing? Oh my goodness, you need to get your eyes over there, you know, because I don't think it's going to be very good. It's not going to be turn out good. You're not going to like this. That's a tail bearer. They use information to gain position, you know, and that's what a slanderer does. They use information to gain position over someone like that. They're power brokers to gain influence. But it's usually information that tears down the reputation of another. That's why the word slanderer is, is associated with the word talebearer. Now, again, it's not wrong to talk about people, but it's wrong to talk about people in a way that tears them down or in a way that spreads a negative report about them. You know, when you're constantly spreading negative reports. Now, this is hard to do. I have to admit, this is a hard thing to do, to, to keep from getting caught up in that because Proverbs 26, 22 says, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles and they go down in the inmost body. It's like a, a, a box of, you know, Nordstrom's truffles just sitting right there or, or sees candy, you know, the, the golden box of truffles and you walk by and you go, okay, I'll just have one and then you have one and then you think, well, you know, maybe two and the next thing you know, the whole box is gone. You know, you just can't avoid it. You know, we were at, um, at uh, some place and they made these, my favorite are these, uh, um, these, these white frosting covered like Oreo cookie things. And so they, they had a few and, you know, there's like three left over and, and they're like, yeah, there's, there's these things here. And I said, who made them? So, oh, I made them. Oh, they're homemade. That's, that's like, that's right there. Instant. I'm falling. I'm falling. No one's going to catch me, you know, and I don't want to be caught. You know, it's one of those things, you know, there's some things where you don't want to be caught, you know. Some sins you want to be caught. Others you say, just let me go. And uh, when it's those white little chocolate covered things, man. And, uh, and so I admit I ate all of them. Uh, but that's like what listening to a tail bear is like. He's like, you just, you like, tell me more. Oh my goodness. So, you know what? I don't want to gossip right now, but just a little bit more. Just tell me something else. And th then we'll be done, you know. That's why soap operas are so popular. You know, because they're, all they are is just uh, one big gossip fest, you know. But here's the thing. You have to know that a talebearer is not your friend. You have to know that. A talebearer is not your friend. They're actually what the Bible calls perverse. Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisper separates the best of friends. A whisper separates the best of friends. You know, I've lost friends because they believe the words of a talebearer. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll like, oh, did you hear it? And they're like, oh, really? Yeah, but don't tell anybody. They always say that. Do you notice that? Don't tell anybody. You know, this is between us because I don't want it to get out and I don't want to hurt his reputation. But what you don't know is that after you left, then the next person came, they said, now, and don't tell anybody. Then the next person, and don't tell anybody. So all of you guys, what does that make you feel? Powerful. I know something that no one else knows. And I can't tell anybody. They really trust me. They think 
I'm their friend. No, you're not their friend. And they're not your friend. They're perverse. They're, they're crooked. They're twisting reality. What do you do if you're in that situation? You know, maybe you've got someone that's uh, saying things about you. Well, you pray and you trust the Lord. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You pray and you trust the Lord. God is the one who defends us. We don't defend ourselves. He's our rear guard. That means he takes care of what's happening in the back. We can't defend ourselves. So you have to let it go, and you have to trust the Lord, and you have to keep moving forward. And let God be the one that takes care of it. Every time I've done that, God does an excellent job of covering my back. But when I try to take care of it, I always make it worse. It always blows up in my face. It becomes a greater problem. Proverbs 26, 20 says, Where there's no wood, the fire goes out. And where there's no tail bearer, strife ceases. You know, I like to end negative reports by going to the source and hearing it directly from the horse's mouth. You know, this happened to me recently. So I heard some negative things about someone that's a friend of mine. So I just called my friend up and said, Hey, I've heard this about you. Is it true or not? You know, and of course, as it turned out, it was half true. It wasn't fully true, but it was half true. And it gave my friend an opportunity to explain to me what the situation was. And I said, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Now it's done. You know, it doesn't get spread. And if I hear someone spread anything, I'll say, you know what? I talked to my friend and uh, that's not the case. So please don't say that anymore. You see, it just kind of ends all the discussion when we do that. But so often what happens is we don't do that. We repeat, we repeat, we repeat. And what that does is it, instead of helping a situation, it makes it worse. But it's amazing how things clear up when you just go right to the source and say, hey, I've heard this about you. I just want to know. You know, so many arguments, my, you know, when, when our kids were young and they would come and they would say, you know, well, mom said this. And I'd say, oh, well, mom's a bad person. And then, then you know, and you shouldn't listen to mom. I, you listen to me. I'm dad. And then, then they'll go to mom and they'll say, dad, dad said this. And, you know, mom will say, oh, dad doesn't know. I'm the mom. You know, and we go back and forth. I'm the mom. And basically they're just lying. They're making it up. They didn't talk to anybody. They just figured out they can get our goats by doing that, you know. And so we, you know, you go to the end of the day and we're not talking to each other. Because I know what you said about me. You know what I said about you. And the thing is, is that there's no real problem here. You know, it was just all, you know, because of, uh, of gossip and not really checking in with each other, not checking in the source. I want to end with this proverb this morning. It says, Proverbs 21, 23. It says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Every time I let my guard down, I get in trouble. Every time. I wish I, wish I could get by one of these times. I wish I could, you know, not get in trouble. But I get in trouble every time. I just recently got in trouble because I let my guard down. I didn't guard my mouth and my tongue. You know, that word guard means to take great care over. It means to pay careful attention to keep the covenant with your words. You know, it's, it's not just taking care of what you're saying. It's, it's protecting the covenant of relationship that you have with the Lord and that you have with each other. You see, we are in a covenant relationship with each other. God made a covenant with us. He said, I will be your God. You will be my people. And we responded when we said yes to Jesus. We said yes we will be your people. You will be our God. Now we have this covenant, this agreement with each other. And so when we guard our words, we're protecting that covenant. I'm protecting my friendship with you by guarding my words. I'm protecting my relationship with God, my friendship with God by guarding my words. And that's what he's talking about when he talks guarding his mouth and tongue. It's protecting the covenant that we have with each other and with God. Every time I speak or write a response without prayer and waiting on the Lord, 
I always regret what I've said. You know, I always regret it. When I forget that we're all fragile people. We're all fragile people. We're just doing the best we can. You know, as we're learning how to follow Jesus. None of us are experts, you know. None of us have arrived. But it amazes me how you'll talk to some folks and they, they think they have. And they want to judge you or me because of that. You know, my brother isn't my enemy. My brother is my brother. And I'm called to love my brother. We're called to love one another. And so I want to protect our relationship. I want to protect this covenant that we have with God and with each other, that we are his people. He is our God, and he lives through us and loves through us and wants to bless others through us, wants us to be a blessing and wants us to bless his heart. And so whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. We've heard that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Thing is, words do hurt. And you might be carrying the pain of some of those words. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God loves you. He loves you. And those things that were said over him, over you, those aren't his words. His words towards you are full of compassion. His words towards you are full of mercy. His words towards you are full of forgiveness. His words towards you were to give you hope and to encourage you, to edify you and to build you up and to strengthen you, to comfort you. That's his words toward you. And so maybe this morning is a good time for you just to evaluate the things that you've heard and just say, Lord, that's not your word to me. Those aren't your words. So I'm going to let all those words go. And I'm going to do what we read about earlier. I'm going to hold on to your word. What you say about me. Who you say that I am. I'm accepted in the beloved. That I'm loved. That I have a future and a hope. And I'm going to let your Holy Spirit do that work of unraveling my identity from those words and setting me free to receive what you say about me. Let's pray. Father, you... You've told us in, our, in your word this morning that you've given, our, given us power in our words, Lord, to speak life to each other. But Lord, also, our words can hurt each other. And sometimes we have said things that have caused our own hurt, have caused us to hurt others, Lord. And Lord, this morning I pray if there are any that are in that place, Lord, that they would hear your word for them. That they would find in your word strength, comfort, and truth, Lord. Lord, that they would hear what your scriptures say about us, Lord. Lord, that you gave everything for us, Lord, so that we could spend eternity with you, Lord. We're the pearl of great price that you bought the whole field to get, Lord. We're the treasure, Lord, that you went after, Lord. We're the apple of your eye, Lord. And Lord, that your word would have its effect in our lives and set us free from the words that have been spoken over us, Lord. And I pray that we as a church, Lord, would be known for grace-filled words. Words that build up. Words that strengthen and bring comfort, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.